Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Politics and Prose. I'm Brad Graham, the co-owner of the, the bookstore, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. And uh, we, ha we have a, a great program for you this evening featuring David uh, Herzenhorn uh, and his new book about Russia's leading political prisoner and foremost opponent of Vladimir Putin, Putin uh, Alexei Navalny. Uh, David's experience covering Russia includes um, uh, four years from uh, 2011 to 2015 as foreign correspondent uh, for the New York Times based in, uh, in Moscow. Uh, shortly after that, he, um, he joined Politico as chief Brussels correspondent for uh, Politico Europe, where, where he was able to continue reporting on Russia and, and Ukraine, uh, in addition to uh, the EU and transatlantic relations. Then a year and a half ago, uh, he jumped to the Washington Post uh, to edit uh, out of Brussels uh, that paper's coverage of Russia, Ukraine, and uh, Eastern Europe. So he's been, he's been following events in Russia uh, for, for, for a while. Um, in his book, he, he, he does a, a great job not only recounting uh, Navalny's, Navalny's uh, life and how he's evolved, but also what he's like, what, what, makes him, what makes him tick, and what he represents in, in Russia today as part of that, that generation uh, that straddles the end of the Soviet Union and, and birth of the, of the Russian Federation. Uh, although that biography is titled uh, the dissident, uh, David's quick to note at the start that Navalny himself d doesn't like that label because it harkens back to a group of resistors in, in Soviet days who, who never won much um, in Navalny's view. And Navalny sees himself in, in grander, uh, more ambitious terms, as um, I'm sure you'll hear David uh, talk um, uh, more about in a minute. Instinctively political, Navalny prefers to be known as a politician and the undisputed leader of Russia's opposition, someone who's spoken out forcefully against tyranny and official corruption. And he, and he certainly is that, having, having in fact risked his life in the process amid several assassination attempts, the most famous being the effort to poison him in 2020. Uh, although these days, uh, Navalny exercises his resistance from prison where he's been sentenced to serve nearly 30 years on various trumped-up charges of fraud, embezzlement, and extremism. And today, in fact, is the third anniversary of when Navalny, as you uh, probably remember, returned to Russia and was immediately arrested. Uh, that, was, that was three years ago today. Uh, as uh, as courage, courageous and defiant as Navalny uh, is portrayed, in David's book. He's also, in David's balanced telling, uh, shown to be complicated and, and paradoxical with a history of nativist and nationalistic views that have made him at times pr problematic for, for some in the West. Uh, all in all, the, the dissident goes uh, a very long way towards better understanding both, both Navalny uh, and the Russia that sadly remains far from uh, Navalny's aspirational view of it as someday democratic, free, and fair. Uh, in discussion with David, uh, we also have a, a, a special treat. Uh, we have two other journalists who know Russia very well, Peter Baker and Susan Glasser. Uh, Peter is the chief White House correspondent for the New York Times and a political analyst for MSNBC, and Susan's a staff writer at The New Yorker and, and global affairs analyst at at CNN, basically they have the media blanketed. Um, uh, to get, together they spent a tour uh, in, in Moscow as co-bureau uh, chiefs for the Washington Post in the early 2000s, and out of that they co-authored a great book, Kremlin Rising, about the early years of Putin's uh, rule in Russia. They've also jointly written an excellent biography of former master power broker James Baker and an authoritative book, uh, The Divider, about Donald Trump's presidency. So please join me in welcoming David, Peter, and Susan. All right, wow, what a great crowd tonight. It's not cold out at all, is it? <laughs> Thank you guys for coming, what a terrific group. Uh, 
I have to say, I couldn't be more delighted to be here tonight with David, because David and I worked together for a number of years in the Washington Bureau of uh, the New York Times, and he cut his teeth on all the chaos and craziness that he would cover overseas by covering the United States Congress, which is probably a pretty good preparation for, uh, for some of the things he's seen ever since. But he's also not only one of the, uh, the best, smartest, and fairest journalists I know, also one of the best colleagues I ever had. Uh, we ever had in the Bureau. We still miss you, David. Thank you very much. He's also, also more importantly, the father of one of the hottest college journalists I in the country today, who I think may be here someplace. There we go. You haven't uh, ousted any university presence today, have you, Miles? <laughs> Not today. Okay. Well, Miles Herzenhorn is here. We're grateful to have him here. Yay, Miles. Great work at the, uh, at the Crimson these last few weeks. So, um, David, we want to talk about uh, Navalny. I, I suspect a lot of people here are Russia people, but there may be some people here who just, just love a good book, which is the great thing about PNP, which is such a fabulous establishment. And Brad, thank you very much for including us. We always love being here, and you've done such a remarkable job in making this uh, such a, keeping this and preserving this as a pillar of the community. So, for those who may not know much about Alexei Navalny, as famous and important as he is, tell us a little bit about more about who he is and why you decided to write a book about him now. It is the third anniversary, so it's, the timing is great. Um, sure. Well, first, you know, great thanks to Politics and Prose and to you, uh, Peter and Susan, uh, for, for doing this. Um, there, were, there were a few ulterior motives in, in inviting uh, Peter and Susan, uh, not just to present the full mainstream media conspiracy, <laughs> but because you are um, trenchant uh, Russia watchers, and also I knew that if news broke and one of you had to bail, the other one could <laughs> step in. Um, Very but, good. but also, um, for those of you who know uh, a little bit about uh, Peter, he's chronicled now five American presidents, and of course, in uh, all that time, there's been one president of the Russian Federation, uh, which says a lot. Um, so Navalny, why Navalny, why now? Well, credit um, uh, to Sean Desmond, my terrific editor at, uh, at 12, um, who proposed the idea. Navalny had been arrested. He was already um, back in Russia and had gone to jail. And in fact, there was no general interest book about Navalny. He's yeah. such a public person. Um, and this can present a challenge in writing about someone who is so open, so public, but has also uh, very carefully crafted a certain image. Um, and maybe that uh, has folks shy away, but um, Sean and I had been looking for a book project to do together. We're friends for a long time. Um, every once in a while, I'd come up with some wonky idea about politics or this or that, and he said, isn't there a Russian mobster you could write about? <laughs> and in the end, um, Navalny provided that kind of character, I think, that, that fit what both of us were looking for in a project. And the challenge uh, there being that no one had, had done this. I mean, this is a guy who, he's very, very public, um, but in fact, there are many, many things that folks, even who have followed his career for a very long time, didn't know about him. The, the main one, um, and the Washington Post uh, graciously did a nice um, adaptation excerpt about this, is he's half Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. That his grandfather, um, his grandparents on um, his father's side, his father is born in Ukraine, he spent childhood summers in Ukraine. Um, so it was a lot of fun to tackle that. To d what could I learn? Even having covered him when I was in Russia, what could I learn about this guy that I didn't know? And there was quite a lot. Yeah. Well, thank you uh, for getting us started. I, I do think, given that today is the third anniversary of you know, this moment that I'm sure a lot of people uh, here watch the terrific, and I, I did think it was a terrific documentary on Navalny, which, which won the Academy Award last year. But you know, there's a sort of frozen in time aspect to this question of why did he get on the plane? Uh, you know, and, 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 and it's not irrelevant. It's not, a, it seems to me, it's, it's, it's actually at the, at the core of the book that you've written about Navalny is this, this central question about what, it, what does it mean to take on power in Putin's Russia without the reasonable expectation of uh, electoral success or even the ability to actually compete when so many people, Brad was kind to mention the book that Peter and I wrote about the first few years of the Putin presidency, Kremlin Rising. Uh, as you well know, David, many of the people who are characters in that book, they are uh, either dead or in exile or in prison. And uh, in fact, the main characters uh, from start to finish in that book, that's the fate of almost all of them. Navalny knew this. Uh, he was nearly died uh, and you know was really only through a series of accidents that you 
recount very powerfully in the book uh, that he was saved from from death uh, in in poisoning, and yet he chose to get on the plane. What can you tell us about why he got on that plane, and uh, also why whether you think he will ever reemerge from the prisons that he's been uh, sent to? So there there are quite a lot of theories, and this is a, the probably the main question, what was he thinking? How could he possibly, he knew what was going to happen. And in many ways, in many ways he did. Um, there are uh, theories that it's hubris, that he thought he was above this. You know, somebody who was recovering in the hospital in Berlin and got a visit from Angela Merkel, the German chancellor, who thought somehow he was going to be the exception and not end up, um, hard to believe, right? When in fact, uh, it's clear that Kremlin uh, assassins tried to kill him. Um, if you ask me my own guess, it's that he's a fighter. He can't back away from a fight. And this has been true since he was a kid. He got in his share of, of fist fights. Um, Zhenya Albats, who's one of uh, Navalny's mentors, a, a longtime Russian journalist, uh, when I talked to her uh, for this book, she said, we're a nation of prisoners. So I think there was an inevitability also in this that Navalny expected that at some point he would have to do this, that it, there was no avoiding it. Um, but it really is a remarkable thing when you consider it that he knew we have children the same age, um, you know, the time that now three years that he's away from his family, that level of, of bravery, that commitment, he's described it as, as almost his fate, that he's doing it so others, so others don't have to. Um, there's a Russian journalist, television journalist, Evgeny Kislyov, I don't know if you ever met Evgeny, who was ended up being exiled, essentially exiled, forced out of Russia and was living in Kiev and then when the big invasion started, had to leave Ukraine because Russians were no longer um, welcome in Ukraine. I saw him not too long ago in, in Vilnius, in Lithuania, and Kislyov said, you know, Navalny is so brave, and his bravery is absolutely senseless. Mm -hmm. And you can understand why, why somebody would have that view, that in the end, um, you know, he should have seen this coming. But in fact, you know, as obvious as it was, did we realize that Putin was planning a war, that he was ready to destroy a country of... 40, 50 million people, so one man, what does it matter? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, our version of Navalny in that sense was a guy named Mikhail Khodorkovsky, who was, of course, arrested. He was a Russian oligarch, arrested in 2003. He went, he left the country 17 times between the time his partner was arrested and he was arrested. With very clear signals from the Kremlin, don't come back. And he did anyway. We have, we have, we've always asked the exact same question, you know, why go back when you knew? And he may have had the excuse because he didn't imagine it could happen to him. It feels like Navalny, having seen it happen with him and with Khodorkovsky and so many others, Khodorkovsky spent basically a decade in prison as a result, had to have known. And I wonder, if it comes back to your thought about the cleansing or emboldening power of prison experience in Russia, if he wants to be, as you rightly say, an opposition politician, not a maybe a dissident, that he builds credibility for a future life and his view of running the country, I guess. is that? I mean, Hodokoski may have thought the same thing, but of course it didn't work for him. Right, no, there's definitely that aspect, right? That, that belief that if he stayed out, he would become irrelevant, that his political career would be over, that he would be this dissident, and worse, a dissident in exile. And by going back, he would sustain his political career, the possibility that he could be elected president of Russia um, someday. Another interesting aspect of this is Vladimir Putin's answer, and he's been asked about this. And he said in Geneva when he met with, uh, with Joe Biden, he was asked during the Q&A, he said, look, he knew. He knew he was going to be arrested. He came back, so what is there to talk about? That was the answer. Now, of course, Vladimir Putin also doesn't even like to uh, dignify Navalny by using his name. Uh, and it's, uh, it's one of those remarkable things to see Putin's contortions when, uh, when even asked about Navalny. You know, when I read biographies, I'm always fascinated uh, by, you know, the sort of early parts of the book and what does it tell us? Uh, presumably we picked up the book because we already knew something about the person or, you know, had a sense of their record in public life. And, you know, you put your finger on one of the things that's most interesting in your biography about Navalny, which is that he is part Ukrainian and that he spent some of his childhood summers uh, right outside of the what became the exclusion zone for Chernobyl. How did how did that shape him? I mean, I I came away reading this that that Navalny, you know, is from the last Soviet generation. That he's still, uh, you know, he's not as old as as Putin, but that he was still 
profoundly shaped in many ways by his experience as a child in the Soviet Union uh, with all the negatives that that entails, including a belief in a sort of uh, extraterritorial Russia. You know, uh, he's, he's, he's a Russian nationalist who, like many Russian nationalists, is not 100% ethnic Russian. Yeah, no, there's no question that for Navalny and now in the context of the war, this is really difficult. And many Ukrainians despise him at this point. And, you know, even in response to some of the um, social media around this event, people saying he's no better than Putin. And, um, you know, for Navalny, Ukrainians and Russians are the same people. And that uh, sounds like something Vladimir Putin would say, but for Navalny, it's because he looks in the mirror and that's actually what he sees. Mm -hmm. His mother is Russian, his father is Ukrainian. And he thought of and thinks of Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus as brotherly countries, not in a, in a negative way, but there is a Russian chauvinism there that Ukrainians now forcefully disagree with and think is um, uh, leading to essentially the destruction of their, of their country. Um, but as you say, Navalny came out of this generation that had a very, very clear memories of the Soviet Union, of standing on line waiting for milk for his baby brother, um, of his parents going out and standing in these interminable queues for meat, um, you know, the going back for, um, to return bottles for, for deposits and the, the whole ridiculousness of, of the process. Um, so there's no romantic view of, of the Soviet Union um, in Navalny's mind, but it is a very specific generation that he talks about, born from um, the mid-70s, 76, like he was to 82, where they straddle the end of the Soviet Union and the beginning of the Russian Federation. And um, yes, I mean, a, a transformation, I mean, partly I think what drives Navalny is the hopes for them were so dashed. This is the generation that suddenly was able to travel the world that really saw Russia have a chance to become a free, democratic, thriving country, and suddenly it slips back into this authoritarian grip that then gets tighter and tighter and tighter. Um, so I think that also was a motivation for him, yeah. knowing that, that history. Well, I mean, knowing that history, it brings us to the question that, that, that Brad raised, in which, you know, he, he, he called himself a certified nationalist, as Susan said. He does not consider himself, or at least didn't consider himself to be a dissident, didn't like that word, and yet you use that title. So why, why use the title when he didn't want to use it himself? What, what are you trying to say to us with that title? Because it's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and, and there is a danger, and we've seen this um, lately, we don't need to go into details, of, of being too close to your subject. And um, you know, in my case, there was no getting close to Navalny in a, in a prison colony once this book project started. Um, but in fact, uh, and, and this goes to the challenge of writing a, in long form about a story that, that is still very much unfolding. Um, the book was supposed to be done to the printer, finished uh, last summer um, as Navalny was being sentenced in this latest trumped up case, an additional 19 years that brought his total terms to, to 30 years in prison. And I had warned the, the publisher and the editors that we had this one last sentencing coming due um, and to be ready and say, okay, that's the, that's the last thing we can get in. What's the, what's the final number? And then a week later, Navalny po has a long social media post um, about how he's been reading Natan Sharansky's book and now describes himself, sees himself in a book that's clearly written by someone who's widely acknowledged as a dissident. You say that it's come full circle. He now accepts that right. title himself. But um, for, for a long time, he not, absolutely not when didn't you want decided what the title of the book would be. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right. Maybe you convinced him. <laughs> Although, one of the other titles that I've always thought was, uh, you know, an appropriate and very interesting title for Navalny, uh, since we're talking about journalism, uh, is investigative journalist. He is one of the very interesting examples, I think, of someone who has come to political activism and to leadership of a whole movement in Russia that was created around an essentially acts of investigative journalism as advocacy and activism. And, you know, I, he's a genius at, uh, at that. He's a genius at political communication. And he was really in, in a culture that was, you know, pretty slow moving to adapt to new technologies, right? You know, there was still very much the culture of uh, essentially the main national television networks in Russia had remained a dominant source of news, information, and ultimately of propaganda inside uh, the new Russia as it was in, in the Soviet Union, much freer, but still nonetheless 
really grounded in this this national conversation and then Navalny is kind of this breakthrough figure of the new media era who parlays this investigative crusading you know weaponizing information uh as politics so what about that i know he prefers and in recent years has become more of a, a kind of explicitly political leader but I'm really interested in what it means to be a journalist uh, in, in that context in Russia today and what you think it tells us about um, you know, what was possible. People would always say, I'm sure they said this to you when you were in Moscow as well, well, Russia is not the Soviet Union because look, uh, there are all these reporters and you know, look, there is the possibility to report information. Navalny is a very interesting example of, of what Putin might have feared from freedom of the press. There's, there's a lot of tension there between Navalny and the Russian press, in part because he and his team have a very negative view of Russian journalists. I think some of us are, are much more sympathetic to the obstacles that they face in an environment where media is largely state-controlled, state-owned, and it, it didn't start that way. Obviously, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was a much freer press, and the restrictions came in um, tighter and tighter. Um, for Navalny, though, it started out uh, you know, not really as journalism, but as uh, shareholder activism, and, and very boring, right? This is a guy who's trained as a lawyer and in financial services, and he kind of liked reading company prospectuses and looking for where the money was. And I think as um, social media, especially the blogging platform LiveJournal, turned regular citizens into journalists, gave them a platform, he really made the most of that. And it was a remarkable transformation, as you say, where you know, now they've made YouTube you know, movies effectively, right? Putin's Palace is a movie you tens of millions of times. Um, By the way, that's a really, it's a good movie. If <laughs> you haven't seen it, yeah, it's right. pretty, pretty it, revealing. It's very dramatic. And, and an, another thing to, to keep in mind, though, is that um, at the core of that is investigative journalism that was done by Russian journalists and by some American journalists, including a colleague of ours, Scott Shane, um, you know, 10 years before it happened. But then Navalny take, and his team took that and turned it into this blockbuster movie as if it was brand new uh, with a mass audience focusing on this, um, this giant uh, palace that uh, does or doesn't belong to Putin. Of course, we know it, it is for his, for his benefit. But there's no question that information and that type of activist journalism is at the core of what he's done. Um, I would often hear from Russian journalists, maybe you did too, when I was in Moscow, that you can't be, in Putin's Russia, you cannot be an objective journalist the way we aspire to be in the United States. That if you believe in freedom of the press, if you believe in democracy, you're by definition also an opposition activist. So it changes the definition of journalism just right there. Well, you mentioned the, the palace. I mean, is that the reason then that Putin has it in for him? I mean, like, is it, it's personal with Putin, right? It's not just I'm going to crack down on anybody who gets up and, and, and calls me, uh, you know, the emperor with no clothes. He has a very personal, visceral reaction to Navalny, even though he doesn't use his name, as Susan said. Yeah, he, well, the character that you mentioned, the patient, the, they have all sorts of euphemisms that they've used. No, there's no question that it did become personal over time, and uh, and Putin is you know is very sne is sneering when it comes up this idea that this guy hasn't ever run anything, hasn't you know proven himself as any kind of a kind of leader. Of course, you know let him run, let him have access to to media, and uh, and Navalny complains about this that you know he would never get on the federal channels. He would never, oh except when he was being described as a criminal, um, and in fact you know going back before um, um, before he was you know widely known, uh, Navalny had been part of a series of debates, live debates in a format like this and uh, that were held in Russian kind of clubs, bars, uh, with, uh, organized by a, a sort of a youth political movement called Da, yes, uh, and uh, Masha Gaidar, who was uh, the, the daughter of the, the former uh, acting prime minister, was a part of that. And they had a, an offer after doing these successful debates that became kind of a sensation among, um, you know, in political circles in Moscow to do a TV show. And Navalny was offered this job, and they shut it down very quickly. And he was convinced that the order came directly from, um, from the Kremlin's sort of media minders that, no, this guy is not allowed to be on TV, not allowed to, because he knew how to use it. Um, sometimes it was accidental, though, right? His, his sort of famous phrase that became you know, what I would describe as, a, as sort of a first meme, an early meme before we called memes memes, about the, the party of swindlers and, and thieves, or crooks and thieves, Julie Comfy Varov. He said it in a, in a radio interview, sort of by accident, you know, describing Putin's party. And he just has that kind of gift. It's almost innate. You saw it in that case where you know, he just 
says this line and suddenly it's, you know, on bumper stickers and, you know, from Vladivostok, you know, all the way in the Far East to Moscow. Right. So essentially he is the sort of the first great political communicator of the uh, post-Soviet era, essentially. It, it's really, it's, by the way, it's hilarious to have, I mean, hilarious is not the right word, to have Vladimir Putin saying Navalny has never done anything and isn't qualified <laughs> to be a leader because of, you know, Vladimir Putin was the, the man from nowhere uh, who no one had ever heard of, including many of the people who he was placed in charge of the government of Russia. And it, it's a reminder of the, the sort of the weird vacuums. The last year, we've seen a lot of weird vacuums. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can just put your kind of Kremlin watcher hat on and help us to understand that. So, you know, we know the name of Navalny, but largely because he's he's ended up as a more traditional dissident. He's in prison. That's how we knew the name of Sharansky. That's how we knew the name of Solzhenitsyn uh, in the Soviet era. What about actual politics? Does Navalny, in your view, still command a movement inside Russia today? What did all those people leave in the immediate aftermath of the Ukraine war? Are they, uh, you know, hanging out in, in Vilnius and in Georgia and, and Turkey still? Or um, is there a meaningful opposition inside Russia today? Um, it's on life support. There's no question about that. Um, is there political opposition? Of course. And and it's important to remember not just the, the, the names that end up really big like Navalny. I mean, Vladimir Karamurza, um, extremely dedicated, uh, sentenced to 25 years in prison for treason when all the guy wants is democracy for his country, an, an opinion writer uh, for the Washington Post, or Ilya Yashin, who is a colleague in, of, of Navalny's in the, the Yablika, it means Apple, a political party that Navalny first joined uh, when he thought that progressive party was actually going to accomplish something and, and then got very disillusioned by that. So there are, there are political opponents, but of course Putin has squashed that opposition. And in terms of Navalny himself, uh, it's hard to, to draw comparisons, but you might think of him as a, as a Howard Dean or a, you know, a, someone who you know, had a moment but is, n was never fully in step with the mainstream of his country. And the Ukraine war has really um, added to that. It's hard to see how Navalny comes back in politics unless Russia not only is defeated, categorically defeated in this war, but the Russian society accepts that it was wrong. I mean, he's come out now so forcefully, despite Ukrainians, uh, many Ukrainians um, really disliking him and thinking he's uh, some sort of version of Putin. He's come out so forcefully against this war in which thousands of Russians are dying, being told by Vladimir Putin and uh, his propagandists every day that it's worth something, that this is important, that this is an existential fight for survival, that it's really hard to see how he can connect with that electorate in a way that would win him the presidency as he hopes. Hmm. I mean, that's a really interesting question, right? Because we don't know, obviously, without you know, reordering all of Russian society so he could have free access to a free television and all of that. But I mean, he has run for office, right? But he just was never allowed to run in a real way, never given attention. But there is, there is an argument to be made, or at least, I mean, I don't know what your thoughts are. You covered Russia more recently than we have, that Putin, even without the apparatus of repression, is actually in touch with a significant, if not majority, of the Russian people and, and might actually win a free and fair election had it come to it, but he obviously can't afford to take that chance. He would never allow it. It's not his nature. But the, the Russian people, you know, are they given an option? Would they be looking for an alternative to Putin? You would, you would guess, for those of us who cover politics, that, that folks are always looking for, for something new, for improvement, right? But I think one of the, the key points about Putin that's deeply misunderstood in the West is, is how deep his genuine support g runs. And that's partly because he's seen as having rescued the country from the disastrous 90s, when, the, when Russia was actually literally starving um, from the, the sort of chaos of the Yeltsin years. And that, of course, lucky for Putin, coincided with the steep rise in oil prices with an economy that was booming. But for folks who can remember the rush of those days, defaults, when people's bank accounts, were, you know, savings would just vanish, or the Soviet times when, um, you know, for them, Putin was, you know, a, and is a great leader who brought Russia back to, you know, made Russia great again. Um, you know, now, obviously, we'll see how, how much patience they have for this war and how um, resilient the Russian economy proves to be. 
Um, but um, but there is that. There is no question that Putin enjoys much more support um, in Russia than he's often given credit for uh, in in the West. And it's not clear that even in a in a free and fair election that Navalny would beat him. Um, but of course, we won't find out because he doesn't allow it. Right, take that chance. Well, and you know, we've talked about uh, Navalny as a commu- political communicator, as a as an aspiring elected official. The theme that has run through all of his critiques of the Putin years has been about corruption. Uh, and he not only branded Putin's party, the party of crooks and liars, but he, you know, that, that's that been the, the consistent focus. And it's it's the reason that many everyday Russians who turned off to politics in, in any real sense, they hate parties after 70 years of enforced membership in one party. Uh, they are not very much into grassroots activism around elections. But, you know, this was something that even people who might have seen themselves as apolitical could get behind. And he, you know, he had truck drivers, he had people all across Russia at the height of his movement who were willing to sign on to his anti-corruption. Tell us a little bit, I mean, you know, there's a sense that we've gotten much less information now from inside Russia, of course than we did before the invasion of Ukraine. But how much uh, do we see corruption as as being something that you're allowed to talk about even in, in Putin's Russia today? How much is it, you know, still an organizing principle for people to, you know, get behind? Uh, the war is very likely, as many wars have in the past, to increase corruption in Russia, right? Uh, you know, you're reorienting the economy to spend all this money on uh, weapons. You can only imagine that some of the Russian military's very poor performance against Ukraine, uh, a much smaller, weaker, less well-supplied force, has got to be due to corruption. This seems like a core Navalny issue. It's it's a really interesting question and, and a complicated issue. Um, the part of it has to do with the with how Russians view corruption. In general, and and many view it as as endemic. I'm not the, the expert on corruption in my family. My wife Christina, who's a lawyer, works in compliance and ethics, and and would teach uh, when we were in Moscow. I was teaching um, young Russian lawyers who wanted to uh, earn American legal accreditation, and would talk about this the the, the sort of presumption. There was a saying that uh, among Russians that you know Russia without corruption isn't Russia. It's not actually fated to be that way. And you know, and she would ask her students, "Are you corrupt?" You know. No, is your is your family, your your wife, husband, corrupt? No, it's it's not actually destined to be that way. And yet, there's this fatalism about it. And because of that, the the anti-corruption message that Navalny had resonated with a lot of people, but not so much that it was able to carry him to you know some popular movement. And and he did expand that message quite broadly um, when he was uh, when he was poisoned when he was nearly assassinated with a chemical weapon. He was out in Siberia campaigning, and one of the things they were focused on, and they made videos about this, was the dilapidated housing that was just falling apart. I mean, he's focused a lot on the crumbling infrastructure in Russia. Um, One of the uh, buzz phrases that he added, speaking of Navalny as a communicator, was uh, adding to his message of not just that Russia should be free, but Russia should be happy. You You know, pointing out that Russians are often just not happy folks. I mean, they're lovely folks, many of them, when you get to know them. But so as a nation... he was nation, fighting the tide of history on corruption and happiness. And <laughs> happiness. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough fight. No question. We're, we're going to, in a few minutes, we're going to open it up to questions. There's a microphone right here. We'll let you know when to get up and start thinking about your questions. Um, talk a little bit more, though, about... You mentioned the Ukrainians who don't like him, who see him uh um as a as a dangerous figure i think i think there is a feeling in the west that he must be like us because he's against putin right anybody who's against putin therefore must be a western style democrat small d but he's not exactly that talk about i mean he has made overtly racist and anti-immigrant uh, comments he clearly does call himself a nationalist it doesn't mean he's a pro-western I mean, talk a little bit about what he represents and what the west should think of him in that regard Sure. I mean, Navalny really is a, a born politician. This is what the people who know him best say, that you know, he was born to do politics. And in that way, um, you know, some of his positions are as craven as you might expect from uh, 
um, a politician. I mean, he is a Russian nationalist in the sense that he believes his country should be great. Um, he uh, definitely has, um, as you know, some um, retrograde views, let's say, on on race, on Central Asians. Uh, you know, has made some some quite ugly comments uh, throughout the past. Some of it is humor. Sometimes it's it's sort of off-color humor. He had a trip he took once to San Francisco that he was posting on Live Journal various gay jokes. I mean, you know, some of it that you know in the in our current context, you know, certainly seems seems quite um, off-key, but. Um, when you look at his position, say, on immigration, an anti-immigrant position, or a pro-gun position, it, you know, look at the United States Congress, right? I, you know, I'd often point out um, that the U.S. Congress, when I was covering it and now, you know, it has been a pro-gun, anti-choice Congress always, no matter which party was in power. Um, that's just the, the political wins, and Navalny certainly has tried over and over again to catch those, those wins and see where it could take him. So he went from being in what was viewed as the most progressive, uh, liberal progressive in our parlance, um, political party, Yablika, um, to then flirting with hard right nationalists attending the Russian march was a gathering of, um, of some really ugly um, groups, uh, neo-Nazis, et cetera. And he was looking for an ideology that could somehow catch a majority of the country um, and didn't find it and realized that it only got him a whole lot of grief. Um, now, he also tried to spin some of the anti-immigrant views that, well, I'm trying to, you know, they need labor protections, so, you know, therefore they shouldn't, shouldn't be allowed to, to come to work in Russia, et cetera. They're, they're you know, mistreated. Um, that didn't pass the smell test. Um, but a lot of these views were really aimed at ultimately trying to be where the Russian public was and is. And that's where on Ukraine it's quite a challenge. I mean, he danced for a while trying to split the the balance on Crimea that you know the way Putin went about it seizing Crimea invading Crimea was of course illegal but yes Crimea is Russian and no it shouldn't you know it should no one should expect it to be returned it's not a bologna sandwich uh, was the, the famous line um, of course you can't have it both ways and since then he's come out quite categorically against uh, the invasion of Ukraine and the violation of Ukraine's borders but um, that sort of waffling and flip-flop, you know, is, is not unfamiliar to those of us who cover Washington. <laughs> I don't but know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he did, he took this very instinctive, let's go back, because I think people might not be familiar with the, you know, the chronology here. Back in 2014, when Russia illegally annexed the Crimean Peninsula, and, you know, the first such, you know, illegal annexation of territory like this, really since, you know, the period after World War II, Navalny didn't just waffle and he didn't just hedge. He actually came out unequivocally and very strongly said, absolutely, this is Russian territory. And that, you know, Soviet dictator Khrushchev illegally gave it to Ukraine. And that was actually, even at the time, you know, a pretty astonishing statement given that Russia had, you know, multiple times, you know, by treaty and in law guaranteed uh, Ukraine's post-Soviet borders, given that this uh, alleged, you know, malfeasance had happened decades earlier. Uh, you know, it was, it was a pretty shocking statement, even at the time. So shocking to us in the West, shocking to, to people who um, put a lot of stock in, in international law. Um, but one way that I've tried to describe uh, that time in Russia for Americans is you have to imagine that um, by some accident of history, America lost part of South Florida. And not just a certain part of South Florida, but Orlando. You know, someplace everybody has been, they've spent, they have to sell that. At this childhood. point right now, that's not a good question to ask, because people would probably vote to give it away. <laughs> childhood memories, right? And so if then a president had a chance to take it back, to grab it back in the way that Putin did, what would Americans say? Would they say violation of international law or would they say Disney nosh, Disney is ours, the way um, Russians said Crimea is ours? Um, and I got to tell you, what Navalny's position at that time was fully in step with the overwhelming majority of Russians. I mean, my, you know, um, I don't know if it was Miles or his, his brother Isaac, we were at a, a kid's birthday party uh, paintball in Moscow in those days when the kids were running around shooting paintball shouting, cream nosh, Crimea is ours. Um, the, the guy who was in charge of the, the paintball operation also wanted me and another American dad to 
get in the in the mix so you could shoot Americans. So, uh, I think the proper analogy here is Alaska. Actually, <laughs> forget Florida, isn't it? That Russia would you know come and say, well, listen, that was an illegal deal. You know, you guys, you know, you're you're Seward. He stole you know this for us. Come on, he didn't pay enough money. You know, with twenty million bucks. You know, come on. So you know, and that they would take it back. So you know, Russia has has quite a, a tradition of. Um, of hooligans in sports, like soccer hooligans and hockey hooligans. And a colleague of ours, Andrew Roth, once described in this story a great detail, a chant among hockey hooligans who said, Crimea is Russia, Alaska is Russia, everywhere is Russia except Kosovo. Kosovo is Serbia. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't we go ahead and have people come up, and while people come up to ask their question, tell us what we, what we know about how his life is today in prison. Three years in prison, not a fun thing in Russia, not a fun thing anywhere in prison, but Russia especially, and now he's been transferred way out into the Far East. Tell us a little bit about what we know about that, and folks who have questions, feel free to come on up to the microphone here, please. Yeah, so Navalny now is in the, in the far, far north, um, and uh, somehow has maintained his good humor and his good spirits. Uh, started uh, posting, and, and of course he has folks doing this for him, but he gets to meet with the lawyers and then pass messages, and they then um, post on X or elsewhere on his behalf, saying, I'm your new Santa Claus, um, and describing his life in the frigid uh, far north. But we know he's been repeatedly thrown into isolation cells, punishment cells, brutal prison conditions. His health has been poor. Um, you know, maybe even part of this mix, he was accosted by Maria Butina, the, uh, the uh, now uh, propaganda journalist and member of the, of the Duma, but who was arrested uh, here in the United States, right, for, uh, for not uh, registering as a lobbyist um, and, and boasted of her own credentials, having spent time in an American prison and said he should be grateful for his conditions. Um, no, it's a, it's a, it's a brutal um, circumstance, no question, that he's been in um, all the way through. Uh, well, I will um, exercise the moderator's prerogative for one last question, and then we can go ahead and just, I would say, to, uh, so we can get as many questions as possible. Tell us your name, make it a question uh, with a question mark, and uh, you know we'll go from there. But uh, on this question of Navalny in prison, do you believe that Vladimir Putin will ever let him go? It's hard to see that he ever would. At, at this point, Navalny is due to be released when he would be, I think, 75. Um, you know, I think this is a question of, of who dies first, and, um, and that's a scary thought. Uh, Navalny's life has been and is at risk uh, while he remains in prison. Uh, his team, his family often points out that he is now in the clutches of a government that tried to kill him. There's just no question about it. Uh, you know, independent investigations have proven that, but whether it's by um, you know, German forensics or by uh, Bellingcat, uh, we know what happened. Uh, there, so it's it's really difficult to see how, as long as Putin is in power, that um, Navalny uh, is ever set free. On the other hand, you point out about Khodorkovsky, and I was there uh, this day after Putin's big annual press conference, where in a small group of reporters uh, talking off mic, he just sort of casually announces that he's now pardoned Khodorkovsky, and some of that is to show that. Um, he toys with lives, that he can do this on a whim. And might it reach that point if he feels so confident, if uh, the war has gone in his favor? Perhaps, but it's really hard to see that. Uh, I, guess it, I guess this is really just a re request for some clarification over right. Navalny's position on Ukraine vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Uh, you mentioned that, well, one, he's half Ukrainian. Um, He's against the war in Ukraine, but on the other hand, he uh, seemed to respect the, the Russian claim that Crimea was part of Russia. Um, can you imagine, either for reasons of political expediency or anything else in the future, that Navalny would agree that all of Ukraine is part, quote, part of Russia? Well, it would be another flip-flop, and a big one, right? At this point, he's come out quite categorically against the war, um, he has spoken out in support of respect for Ukraine's internationally recognized sovereign borders, including right. Crimea. Um, he's come ducked around that by saying, you know, as defined in 1991. Um, but he's been very clear about that. He's also called for compensation, for Ukraine to be compensated for the war using uh, right. revenue from Russia's oil and, and gas um, exports. So it would be quite a switch. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think that that's possible. I don't know that mm -hmm. that um, even, you know. How does he see it um, historically? 
I mean, um, proven so, tries to make the case that historically it's been part that, of Russia. That, yeah, the, um, you know, certainly the Ukrainians don't allow that. I mean, Alexander Lukashenko doesn't allow that about Belarus right. either, right? So it, maybe it's... Maybe Russians do, or some Russians do. I, you know, I think they're, they're, you know, I don't believe that Navalny would ever go that far. There are, you know... <laughs> At most, he splits the hairs, as you've heard about, like Crimea's Russian territory. And we know, I mean, I have reporters, you know, right now out covering um, the war in the east of Ukraine. Some of the reporting has to be done in Russia because folks speak Russian as their native language. Um, there are a lot of divided loyalties. It's a very tangled, complicated right. history. But at this point, Navalny is quite on record um, as saying this is a criminal war and Ukraine, Russia needs to withdraw its forces immediately. Ukraine needs to be compensated. Again, that may put him in great peril with the Russian electorate if, if he's ever free and if right. he's ever running for anything. Yeah. Um, but that's his position at the moment. Thank you. Hi, thanks very much for a great conversation. Uh, my name's Doug Klain. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, obviously Russia's opposition and Navalny's team, they're in a very different place now than they were just a couple of years ago when they thought they could bring about change in Russia through elections. How do they think now about the future and their role in Russia in the future? Uh, yeah. Well, you know, I think it's it's good to follow them and, and hear what they're saying. And his team, you know, Navalny's team is quite active uh, still. You can find them on, on social media, putting out uh, videos all the time, um, campaigning very strongly against uh, the war, but also pointing out where uh, the West sometimes is falling down in terms of sanction, sanctions enforcement and the like. Um, there's no question they're now working in exile, that the change, if there's gonna be change brought about uh, for Russia, it's gonna happen from the outside. And so I think you're seeing, you know, historically we've seen this where, you know, governments, you know, or future governments start to form in exile with a hope that political conditions then change and give them a chance uh, to um, put the country on a whole new trajectory. Hi, I'm Stephanie Olson. Um, my question is, if you didn't have any access, as you said, to Navalny directly, how did you do your research for the book? Um, well, there's there's a ton. I mean, of um, Navalny is you know hugely public and is written extensively and posted on his blog extensively. So there's a lot of Navalny in his own words, um, right up until the moment, and he went to prison, and even after, he's continued to to tweet or and and post and write in in his name or uh, folks are doing it for him. But you can usually tell the trademark. Um, Navalny language. Um, so his own words were a huge part of that. Um, there is a lot of documentation, you know, not a lot, uh, not in book form. Um, There's one short biography of him written by, by someone who's sort of a friend of his, an early biography that was very, very helpful. Um, tons of news coverage going back in, in uh, Russian, but also in international press. Uh, so um, really, it was a matter of just going back. I mean, there's too much material, in fact. You know, this is a situation where you have more material than you could ever put into, into any book, and then um, sort of peeling it apart, but also talking to people who knew him well, um, who know him from, you know, his earliest days getting into politics. Uh, there's been tremendous work by, by Russian journalists uh, covering Navalny over the years. Uh, so th there was ample, ample material. Hi, my name is Bob Carr. My brother is a conservative who's forgotten he was anti-communist. How did this happen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there have been a few twists and turns in, uh, in politics. Uh, you know, the, maybe the, the authors of The Divider have, are better equipped uh, <laughs> to, to answer that. Well, I, you know, real quickly, not because we have David's book here to talk about. I, I think you're right that politics have flip-flopped in a way in America, and it's very strange to see the Republican Party under the current uh, frontrunner for the nomination um, seemingly so friendly with, with Moscow when that was the raison d'etre of the, you know, Goldwater-Reagan right. uh, Republican Party. But I think it's partly about ideology. The, the, the Russians at that time under the Soviets were perceived to be you know, we're, we're communists and perceived, therefore, to be allied of the, the, the left. Putin has made a very determined effort to position himself on the right as the defender of traditional civilization, a defender of orthodoxy as defined both as a religious thing as, as well as a, a, a secular thing, anti-gay rights, anti, you know, uh, progress, right? And that has, that has clearly won some converts here in America, even aside from Trump's own 
hard to understand particular relationship with Russia among the, the far right uh, in the United States right now. So it has kind of flip-flopped a little bit. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I would say that it's true. In particular, Putin, after he came back to the presidency, remember that he faced, you know, and, and, and David was there for, for this period of time, he faced an enormous... Uh, pushback, actually, from what we might consider kind of the liberal uh, intelligentsia in Moscow and St. Petersburg, tens of thousands of people in the streets, the most serious threat to Putin's government since he came into power uh, in, in that famous New Year's Eve 1999. You know, and so one of the responses from that was a much, almost a makeover of Putin, you know, a la Viktor Orban, uh, as a, as a, Fox News approved culture warrior. And it was dating back to this period of time that you have the Donald Trumps and the Tucker Carlsons, uh, you know, sort of starting to embrace Russia and to take what Putin said at face value, uh, you know, that he was some sort of a fellow right wing ideologue. But then there's also, I think, a, a deeper, less prominent history on the American right that, you know, that goes back for, for decades and really even a century or more, which is, you know, a, an outright flirtation with authoritarianism and with strongman leaders in in Europe. Uh, you know, Donald Trump uh, had, I think, some of this even before. I always go back to, there's a, a particularly fascinating interview that Trump gave to Playboy magazine, uh, uh, of all places, uh, you know, at the very end of the Cold War. And in this interview, he criticized Mikhail Gorbachev, the last Soviet leader, for, uh, essentially failing to be strong enough. Uh, and he actually had praise for the leaders of China at this time because of their crackdown in Tiananmen Square. And so I think if you're looking for the, the kind of particular war sack test there of Donald Trump and of part of the American right, not all of it, but part of it. But the final thing is, look at the opinion polls. Go back and look at the opinion polls uh, of American views of Vladimir Putin by party from say 2015 to 2017, you will see an amazing thing. You will see the numbers cross on the charts because Republicans, what did they do? They followed the leader. The shift in Republican opinion about Putin was was really remarkable. And, and maybe I'll just tie this back to Navalny. One thing, as much as folks talk about um, sort of Trump's favorable view of Putin, the reverse is not as true as everybody thinks. Putin is happy to use Trump for the instability that he can help create in the United States. But in fact, Putin views the entire American system as anti-Russian. And if you think back to the, um, the summit they had in Helsinki, I was there. In the end, Putin wiped the floor with Trump in many ways, but didn't get anything substantive out of it. And here, Navalny shares a view and Navalny's team of real um, disappointment in the West and a view that the West has failed on Russia policy. And there isn't this very benign view, as much as um, Navalny has, has you, know, um, you know, embraces the, the, the liberalism, the progressivism, the, the freedom of the West, there's really a belief that the West has failed on Russia policy and has appeased Putin for too long. And this idea that the, there's something wrong in the American-led system that has allowed Russia and Putin to persist in the way that it has. Well, I, I, there's one story that uh, we actually had in our, our book about Putin and, and Trump meeting, which I, I, I you reminded of, remind me of. In Osaka, Japan, they were meeting on the sideline of a G20. And to your point about Putin not exactly, you know, reciprocating Trump's, you know, affection, uh, they're talking about uh, Trump is doing his thing. He's bragging, right? He says, you know, the Poles love me so much they're going to name a fort after me, Fort Trump. And the Israelis love me so much they're naming a settlement after me, uh, Trump Heights. And, and, and Putin, who gets the joke, basically says, well, maybe, Donald, they should just name all of Israel after you. <laughs> and it's just this clearly this moment, this is, this is in private described to us by people in the room, it's clearly this moment where he understands that Putin is, I mean, she understands that Trump is this narcissistic figure who simply loves attention and, and people uh, giving him respect, as he calls it. Uh, and he was he was playing to that, and he was mocking him even to his face. I'm not even sure whether Trump necessarily got the joke, right? But well, but to this this goes back to your book about Navalny and is he a dissident or is he a politician? To be a politician implies that there's a meaningful space for politics. 
inside of Russia, number one. But number two, to be a dissident is to revert to a period of time in which actually the, um, the good offices of the West uh, were part of, they were your, uh, your only hope of not spending the rest of your life in the gulag. And uh, I do think that it's, it's interesting because this strand of you know criticism of the West and anti-Westernism ha- was part of Navalny's political movement in a way that it wasn't of the democratic reformer types uh, who emerged into politics in Russia in the 1990s. But now that Navalny is a dissident, uh, you know, it seems pretty clear that the difference between a Biden and a Trump in the White House is the difference between a president of the United States who would even bother to mention at a summit, uh, you know, this, you know, that was the same summit that Peter's talking about at which Donald Trump was reported to have uh, said admiringly to Xi Jinping uh, at um, at the dinner, correct? Uh, that uh, he was, you know, talking with him about his crackdowns inside of China. Right. Oh, sorry. Chris Carroll from Washington, D.C. First of all, all three of you are great journalists. Thanks for all you do. You. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> David, in your research of Navalny, um, just heading into a fraud election year, what are some lessons that everyday Americans can take away from his experience? Thank you. Um, at, at this point, be careful about travel in Russia, yeah. I guess, is, is one. Um, no, I mean, it, the, the point I was going to add is that it, it brings us back to this question of why did Navalny get on, on that plane, right? And, um, you know, this view in Russia of dissidents and the Soviet dissidents of having taken the easy path, taken the escape um, when uh, the West offered them a path a path out and then going back perhaps after the Soviet Union collapsed but not um, but not having suffered, not having really been willing to, to have skin in the game or, or in the prison colony as the case may be. Um, for, a, for a fraught election year, I guess one, um, one important lesson I would urge uh, Americans to take away is uh, to be grateful you know, for the, for the system that really is durable, um, that has proven despite some, some very difficult trials in recent years, that um, when, I, when I was leaving Russia um, after my assignment with, for the New York Times in 2015, some Russian friends, and of course this is after um, Crimea and the, and the war in Donbass was already underway, and Russian friends say, oh, you're, you're leaving because it's the, the political climate here is bad, it's, it's really getting worse. And I said, no, actually, the, the New York Times wants me to go back to Washington because we have a presidential election next year. And unlike here, we don't know who's going to win. <laughs> <laughs> There's work to do. Um, and you know, it's very easy to, to take that for granted. I think it's taken less for granted after, after January 6th, et cetera. But um, there really is a, you know, there are reasons why people around the world envy a system where you can get free fair media coverage of candidates where um, you know a, a Barack Obama can rise to the presidency uh, where there really is equal opportunity and equal protection under the law um, you know those are things not to be taken for granted and Navalny is a guy who is sitting in a prison colony in you know freezing in the far north essentially for simply demanding a free democratic country for his children that's what he's been looking for. You know, it'd be great if you know politicians didn't steal, but let's you know, not be too cynical or jaded. But politicians steal everywhere on earth, right? I mean, what he's looking for is a core society, the idea that Russia could actually be free, democratic, and happy. That it's not, it's not impossible. That it's not faded. We have so few events in Washington that end on an optimistic note. But I love David's <laughs> pan to American Agreed. democracy. Thank let's you. end on that. Thank you very much, David. Thank you guys for coming. What Thank a great evening. Thank you. So copies of uh, t- copies of David's book are available at the checkout desk. He'll be up here signing. Please form a line to the right of the table.